Messiah, Messiah, couldn't he be Messiah? The one whom the prophets foretold. The love that he teaches, the message he preaches, is it he in the scriptures of old? And when Joseph's brothers saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said to one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brothers, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. Well, here's the coat of Yosef ben Yaakov. Joseph, the son of Jacob. The very sad case. His brothers were just crazy with jealousy about him. He was the son of Jacob's old age, and his father loved him so much. He was his son with Rachel, his favorite of the wives, and he made him this beautiful coat because he was his favorite son. And the brothers just rebelled against it. A sad case, but one that's full of meaning. Jacob was... Uh, uh, a man of uh, many children, and uh, his son Joseph was to live one of the most amazing lives. All of these sons were uh, heads of tribes, but Joseph had a career like nobody else. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the Bible that he dreamed and he interpreted. He had dreams. He wasn't the uh, most tactful person because uh, when he told his dreams to his brothers, it seemed to reflect on them and even on his parents. And eventually, uh, the coat and uh, the stripes on the coat. By the way, that uh, Hebrew word, pasim, we usually say a coat of many colors. It's really a coat with stripes, and it reminds us of Messiah's stripes. By his stripes are we healed. But back to the jealous brothers and the dreams. In Genesis 37, it says, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. He dreamed that uh, they were all binding wheat, and his brother's sheaves of wheat bowed down to his. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for the dreams and for his words. This theme of rejection of a brother is going to come up later. It's going to actually come up in the gospel. Unfortunately, uh, Joseph dreamed a second dream, and he was always straightforward and told his dreams to his families. Uh, dreams are going to figure uh, in Joseph's life all the way through. Well, this second dream is even uh, uh, more obvious and more exacerbating. It says, And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now this time he's got his parents, the sun and moon, and eleven brothers, the ten that despised him and, and that cast him into this pit. And uh, the brother Benjamin, his youngest, who was just a boy then and wasn't out with the shepherds and, and wasn't jealous of his brother. That was uh, Jacob's other son by Rachel. But uh, this time they, they really are uh, tired of it. In verse 10, he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed 
come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? They don't know the meaning, and it would only be with hindsight that they would see why God gave Joseph, who was symbolic of Messiah in many ways, such a dream. All that happened at the time he dreamt is it led to this terrible rejection. On the day that uh, Joseph's brothers threw him into the pit, his father, of course, was waiting back at the home spread at Havron. They had taken out the flocks. Uh, they were in search of uh, good pasture land. Havron is very arid, and uh, they'd gotten themselves all the way to Dothan, which is uh, some 40 miles to the north. And uh, Jacob would send Joseph every now and then. Of course, Joseph was younger and uh, didn't handle the animals as yet. And he would send him out to see the brethren and uh, uh, come back and tell him how things were going. He would give him supplies, and uh, he would get a report from him when he came back. Well, they weren't always glad to see him. In Genesis 37, too, uh, Joseph gave, it says, an evil report. Uh, he told what these young fellows were up to that got so far from home, and it wasn't always uh, a good report. It, uh, Joseph, with his characteristic truthfulness, uh, got them in trouble with their father, Jacob, uh, time and again. Well, on this occasion, uh, he approached, and uh, they about had their, their fill of him. And in Genesis 37, 18, uh, the story is told. And Judah said unto his brethren, you see, they, they, uh, they were going to uh, throw him into the pit. They'd planned it, and, uh, uh, well, the first thought was to kill him. And then they thought, well, we probably should avoid... Uh, blood on our hands and and anyway the story in the scripture judah said unto his brethren what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood come and let us sell him to the ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brothers were content there passed by midianite merchantmen and they drew and lifted up joseph out of the pit and sold joseph to the ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Well, that's how he got down into Egypt. Uh, the story is uh, heavily symbolic of, of Messiah being uh, sold for silver uh, to the Gentiles, uh, to the Romans as it was, and gotten rid of in that way. Uh, Joseph's life is so highly symbolic of Messiah, and as we tell his story, uh, we'll see many things. Well, the goat's blood was put on the coat, and uh, uh, that made it appear as if he were attacked by an animal, which did happen. There were predatory animals uh, in the Israeli uh, uh, pasture lands in, in those days. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Uh, he'll go down into the grave unto his son. He believed in resurrection. As Abraham uh, believed Isaac would be resurrected, at least he believed he would go to him. There would be an afterlife. Like King David with this child that died one week after birth, he said, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. So at least uh, he thinks it is not the last time he'll see Joseph. He says, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Now that may have been a break. Uh, Potiphar was an important Egyptian officer and an intelligent man, and he began to value his Hebrew assistant, who started out as a slave, but soon became uh, kind of in care of uh, Potiphar's affairs, uh, his household, and uh, Potiphar traveled often. And if Potiphar was impressed uh, with Joseph, his wife certainly was. And when uh, the captain of the guard was away, she tried to start up a romantic liaison with Joseph, that he would have none of it. And uh, he rejected her advances, and uh, she told the story the other way around. She claimed that he assaulted her and called guards and so forth. And now the hapless Joseph, who seems to always get the short end of things, uh, ended up in an Egyptian prison. Two years 
he was in prison at the very least, we, we can tell from the narrative, for the uh, attempted rape of Potiphar's wife, which was a, a total injustice. Well, there in the prison, uh, he had important cellmates. Pharaoh's personal butler and the palace baker were both in prison with uh, uh, Joseph. And uh, like all people do, they dreamed some disturbing dreams. And uh, Joseph was able to interpret their dreams for them. This uh, uh, uncanny skill of his, uh, which uh, so irritated his brothers when he interpreted his own dreams to them, well, he, uh, he made it available to uh, his cellmates, and, uh, and he was quite right in his uh, uh, dream interpretations. There was good news and bad news. Uh, the butler would be restored to his job at the palace. He was not part of an intrigue. Maybe it was an assassination attempt or something of that kind. But in any case, he wasn't guilty, and they would find that out, and he would be restored to his position, and that was the good news. Unfortunately, Joseph had to tell the baker that he would be hanged, and uh, that was true. He was hanged. Well, then time went on. Joseph lay forgotten in the prison. As the butler left, Joseph said to him, look, you're going to live on and you're going to be in the palace. Won't you remember me, the fellow that interpreted your dreams? And uh, the butler said, oh, sure, I'll remember you. And away he went and back into Pharaoh's service. And of course, he was next to Pharaoh. He was his valet. He was uh, in his household. And Pharaoh spoke to him often. And oh, more time passed, years. And then... Uh, uh, Pharaoh had a dream that disturbed him. In fact, he had it twice. He had a recurring dream. He dreamed of uh, s uh, lean ears of corn and then fat, healthy ears of corn, and then lean cattle and fat, healthy cattle. And this image went, went around twice, and, and at that point, the butler, uh, his memory was jogged when Pharaoh said, you know, I had a dream that rather troubled me. And the butler said, you know, I once had a dream that bothered me. And uh, a fellow interpreted it for me who's still available to us. I'm sure that this Hebrew is still in prison. And uh, in that way, he remembered him. If Pharaoh hadn't had that dream, I think Joseph might have died in that prison. But uh, God was working in Joseph's remarkable life. Well, he was brought before Pharaoh. And in Genesis uh, 41, uh, we get the story of, of what happened at that point. Uh, he came before Pharaoh and said that the God of Israel would give him an answer of peace. And for that, uh, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. I'm in Genesis 41:32. Uh, this is uh, 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 Joseph's analysis. He predicts seven uh, years of plenty and seven lean years. I think we know the story. And he says, and for, because the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to my word, according to thy word, he says, shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Imagine, and this, he says, is because uh, the Spirit of God was, was in him. Pharaoh seems to uh, respect the God of Israel in this passage. Well, uh, what a thrill for Joseph. And there was more in it uh, for him than that. He was not only appointed like a vice Pharaoh, a ruler over all Egypt, but the king gave him Asenath, a Gentile bride, and uh, gave him authority to collect... Uh, an extra 20% in taxes over the, the seven lean years in order to, or the seven uh, uh, rich years in order to prepare for the seven years of famine. Well, Canaan was not as ready, and uh, Jacob sent his sons down to Egypt. You see, the famine was area-wide. Egypt was affected, but it was ready. Canaan was affected. They were not ready. Animals were dying. There was no water, and in desperation, uh, Jacob, uh, with his large family and their wives and grandchildren and so on, uh, sent his sons down to Egypt to ask for food, some sustenance. And there, there develops uh, a marvelous scene, a throne room scene in the Bible, where uh, the brothers come before Joseph, and uh, they don't recognize him. Uh, it had been many years since they sold him as a teenage boy, 
And now he was uh, in the garments and in the throne room of Egypt, and uh, they were bowing uh, respectfully to the vice pharaoh, and uh, uh, he was speaking to them through an interpreter in Egyptian. Of course, he recognized them. And it's, it's a, an amazing scene where at first he does not identify himself, but just looks at his brothers, and, and he actually withdrew from the chamber at one point during the interview to uh, uh, just, just to weep, just to pull himself together. And he came back out and he looked at them and he finally he broke down and he said, I am Joseph, doth my brother Benjamin yet live? And they still didn't understand. Now the vice pharaoh of Egypt seemed to be going mad before their eyes. They didn't know what he's talking about. And finally, it gets through to them that the one they sold into slavery is the one they're bowing before. And uh, there is a tearful reunion and, and Joseph does not uh, discipline them but forgives them. And, uh, and he arranges for Jacob and his whole household to come down into Egypt. And that's how Israel went down into Egypt, 70 people into the land of Goshen. And uh, there they could uh, be husbandmen. It was fertile area, and, and they could eat and so on. And as to Joseph, uh, after he died, four centuries went by, 400 years. And then in accordance with his wishes, they carried his body through the entire exodus and the wandering in the wilderness and uh, he could be buried back in the Promised Land. The fascinating thing about the life of Joseph, as with so many other Old Testament lives, is that it uh, pictures Messiah. The events of Messiah's life are lived out by the Old Testament personalities, and Joseph is one of the key ones. To begin with, he was beloved and honored by his father. He was a favorite. Uh, then he was considered a dreamer by his brothers. This was uh, an opinion about uh, the Messiah too, that uh, uh, his thoughts of uh, uh, brotherly love and people uh, uh, being kind to one another and forgiving one another and so on were, were just so many dreams. Anyone could say that, but it really wasn't going to happen. And his pictures of the kingdom, uh, they just didn't believe in it. That was like a dream. So they were irritated by his dreams. Then he was rejected by his brothers. Of course, that is the story of Messiah. Although those that read about Messiah today that don't believe in him suppose he's a great king and beloved by all, the prophets say he's despised and rejected of men, as Isaiah 53 says. Then he was sold for silver and cast into a pit. Uh, a pit is death in the Bible. And uh, so he's killed. And then by that act, he is sent to the Gentiles, just as Joseph's brother brothers uh, sent him on to the Gentiles. But once there, he becomes a ruler among the Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles have picked up on Messiah and given him an exalted position. There was a time in the first century when the king of the Jews, when, when, when Jesus was uh, not acceptable to Gentiles, when the apostles first went to Athens, uh, to, to the empire, if you remember uh, Paul at Athens, uh, they, they scoffed, they laughed. Uh, they too uh, uh, rejected it. Well, Joseph was in prison when he came to, to Egypt, but later he became the ruler, and uh, uh, so has Messiah. Then there's the Gentile bride. The church is the bride of Christ, and Messiah has taken a Gentile bride. Uh, Joseph was given a bride by Pharaoh. And then he is sought after by his brothers in their time of great need. When uh, there is famine in Canaan, uh, uh, the brothers finally come and they bow before Joseph and they fulfill that early dream of his where their sheaves of wheat bow before him and where the sun and the moon and the uh, stars bow to him. Well, uh, the dream is finally fulfilled. <coughs> Jesus finally will be recognized at his second coming by his brethren and there will be complete reconciliation. Zechariah 12.10, they shall look upon me whom they've pierced and mourn for him as for an only son and a fount of cleansing will be open unto the house of David. We've pointed out in several of our programs because that is the theme of many of the messianic prophecies, the ultimate salvation of Israel. Uh, as Paul says in Romans 11:26, all Israel will be saved when the deliverer comes out of Zion. All surviving Israel, this is to say, after the Antichrist and Armageddon. But finally, there will be that throne room scene. Uh, the brothers will see him, and they, they may not even recognize him at first. The Lord comes out of heaven in a heavenly garment uh, with King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his robe. And uh, there's probably a moment of shock, and then they... And then they recognize him, and there's a beautiful reconciliation, and he does not punish them, but forgives them. And then 
the ruler provides the kingdom, as Joseph provided the land of Goshen for the Israelites. Uh, the king who comes will provide the kingdom for the Israelites. The Old Testament lives and the New Testament fulfillments are one of the great elegancies of the Bible. One of the proofs that it's not just mythology and not just poetry, uh, it follows a life here and a fulfillment there. The scripture itself says it in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 10:11, it says these stories are for us. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. For those of us who live in the age of the end of the world, in the time of the return of Messiah and the start of the kingdom of God, we can look back at the lives of those who lived in the Old Testament and see how God pictured Messiah in their lives. Joseph, uh, one of the sons of the patriarchs, and what a life story. Yosef is his name in Hebrew, almost the same. You know, we made the point in our uh, location uh, portion of the program about how the Old Testament presents biographies. Uh, that's very important. You know, in places where the Old Testament isn't read, church doctrine becomes kind of a handbook of... Uh, uh, New Testament uh, rules, laws, relationships, and so on. It's, it's good. I mean, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. But it's not complete. The Old Testament is 75% of God's Word. And in the Old Testament, we see the day-by-day -day living that people did. Uh, the pathos of a King David when he stumbled in sin. Uh, King Solomon in, in all his glory and, and uh, uh, Abraham. And, uh, well, Joseph is a beautiful example. What a life he really led. I mean, rejected by his brother, sent off to a foreign nation. He becomes the vice pharaoh. First, he's almost executed. Finally, he, he uh, is reconciled with his brothers. Uh, it's a story constructed, as we said, to reflect Messiah. It's, it's not an ordinary life. It's a life uh, stage managed by Almighty God to make a certain point. Little hints throughout, like, like that coat of many colors. We're used to translating it that way. The Hebrew word is pasim. Uh, in modern Hebrew, that's simply stripes. Uh, Joseph was wearing stripes when his brothers rejected him. And Messiah, of course, wore stripes as part of his sacrifice. He was flogged. Uh, Isaiah says, by his stripes are we healed. Little hints like that uh, throughout the lives of the patriarchs make the Old Testament so very relevant to the church. It seems as though, uh, you know, I've heard the... Uh, the New Testament, when it's bound by itself, called the Amputated Bible. Uh, that, it's a, a funny expression. It's described as a, a roof with no house beneath. In other words, uh, without the foundation, with, without the, the beginnings and uh, uh, these, the stories that are relevant to the human condition, it's hard to appreciate even why we're saved. Uh, in another context, uh, uh, on a previous program, we said, without law, how do we appreciate what grace is? Uh, how do we know what forgiveness is if there was no law in the first place to break? And so uh, the, the Old Testament in its biographies, in its principles, is very important. Stephen thought so. The apostle Stephen was martyred in Acts 7, and he taught the whole story of Joseph. In Acts 7, 9, he begins, and he teaches in high detail exactly what Joseph did. His point was uh, to tell those who are about to stone him they've always resisted these revelations of God and he was going to give them the revelations and he did so well I'm glad uh, we could show it to you uh, we found a pit out there in the wilderness very like the one they threw Joseph in now when I say they threw him in this pit you realize that there was no sign on it saying this was the one but a scene very much like we read about in, in Israel we find him it's so nice to be able to tell it to you and remember Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim pray for the peace of Jerusalem